if you tune in to me, you're watching Gully TV. I have a video that I'd like to share with you guys tonight. It was originally published in 2017, and it actually didn't do numbers. It's a very, very dope video. I'm re-releasing this video um, based on the topic contained within the video. Um, the video that I'm speaking of is called Kicking It With Brother Wally. Brother Wally is an elder um, gentleman that I met at a masjid. He has, he like a lot of the older Muslim brothers that you encounter in Sunni masjids today or yesterday's Nation of Islam members. And um, I asked Brother Wally several questions about Malcolm, Malcolm X and the murder of Malcolm X. Um in 2017 and ironically it's become Malcolm X and the murder of Malcolm X has become a has become a trending topic recently due to the fact that he has a documentary on Netflix called The Murder of Malcolm X very powerful documentary I don't know who all seen it but um brother Wally is from the south but he was raised in Newark New Jersey um through his formidable years, he caught lots of cases there, served time with a lot of these guys from Temple 25. He actually attended meetings at Temple 25. I knew all of this years ago, but the significance of Temple 25 didn't mean anything until recently because of this documentary. And it was um, exposed in the documentary that the assassins that killed Malcolm X were from Temple 25 in Newark, New Jersey. Um, Brother Wally is in his 70s. He served time in Lewisburg, Broadway, and Trenton State. He's a childhood friend of Akbar Prey. He has a lot of information contained within this interview. Um, I think this interview shows that my platform um, is way before its time. If you just listen to some of the information that you're about to get out of this interview, it's a 30-minute interview, by the way. You're going to see how many years, how many light years I'm ahead of my competition. Not to my own horn. I'm just telling y'all what it is. Um, this, uh, this piece is called The Gangsters and the Murder of Malcolm X by Brother Wally. I would like for you all to like share and comment this video subscribe to my channel the real gully tv enjoy yo yo if you tuned in to me you know you're watching gully tv i got a special guest today this is a elder gentleman from my masjid by the name of brother wally brother wally has a lot of insight and um knowledge on things past and present he's been in the nation of islam He's been in Islam 30 years? Yes, sir. 30 plus years. Um, he served some time throughout state and federal correctional facilities. He wrote a book on his life called The Metamorphosis of Tank. Show the book, bro. And I got him here on Gully TV so we can just chop it up with him. How you doing today, beloved? I'm fine, brother. I'll pay you to a lot. Why don't you give me some insight on your background? Tell my viewers where you're from and where you come up at. Go ahead. Well, I was born in North Carolina. Yeah. I'm 72 years old. And uh, I came up in an era. Let me correct that. I was born in North Philadelphia. Back in the days when uh, a young girl got pregnant with no no. So uh, I was sent back in North Carolina and raised by my grandparents as a sister. Uh, my father was very abusive, drank a lot, uh, my parents were young, and uh, subsequently my mother ran around with my father, so I was raised by my grandparents on the farm. At the age of 10, my parents came and got my sister and myself and took us to Newark, New Jersey, so I was basically raised in Newark, New Jersey. Okay. Okay, and uh went through some tragedy concerning my mother and my father. Okay. Uh, my father tried to kill my mom and uh, Your father killed your mother? He tried to he tried to kill her. Okay. And subsequently we moved across town 
to what would be considered to be the neighborhood. Okay. That's where I came up. Uh, I was introduced to drugs in 1957. And uh, always loved school. Never stopped going to school. I was hanging out with different guys in the streets. Right. Uh, gangs and uh, what they involved. What year approximately was this that you were spending time in your street with interactions with in us? 19, it started in 1957. Okay. And this is back in the days when uh, Nook was very active in gangs, uh, gang activities, different uh, guys who were involved in crime. Nook was based in the city based on hustling. And that's how I came up in the streets and going to school. And as a result of that, when I graduated from high school, I had been arrested a number of times. Okay. And uh, I uh, went to the Air Force, got kicked out for drugs, and came back home uh, in 1965 with the state prison, Trent State Prison, at the age of 21. Is that Rawway? Rawway is. Another prison. Trenton is a top prison. Okay. In fact, uh, Trenton in those days was considered the most dangerous prison in America in those days. Okay. And uh, I was able to take my street skills and survive. Make a very may make a very long story short. Okay. Uh, I was always the youngest in the in in the crowd. Always the youngest. Always eager to be involved and to get down. To get uh, down. Yes. yes right. Th this is how Nook was. This how you know. This is how Nook was. What was happening though? I was slowly getting away from myself. Okay. And the way I was raised as a child, and uh, as a result of that, as a result of that. I found myself involved in a web of wrongness. Okay. Whereby hustling became my way of life. And as a result of that, down through the years, I accumulated a 10 page record. I got clean here in Erie in 1992. Okay. And it stopped in... Not to cut you off. What year did you say you arrived, arrived at Trenton State? 1965. Can you... Uh, okay, you explain the um, social climate. It was a lot of... Um, the movement was still around in the 60s. Explain what prison was like at Trenton State in the 1960s. Trenton State Prison was prison in those days. An example, you didn't have a personal radio. You had a plug in the wall and an earplug to put in your ear to listen to what they played. And they played country and western. Okay. Because it was in South Jersey. Uh, in the yard, it was called a dusty yard because there was no grass in the yard. In those days, in those days, you didn't have personal TVs, radios. You went to the movies on a Saturday morning in the auditorium. Okay. Okay. And the idea of Trenton was to break it. This idea of going to Trenton. Trenton, Trenton was going to say the most dangerous prison in America. And to think of Prison today and prison then is like night and day. It's like night and day. Uh, I found myself not only being institutionalized, but also being able to, to, to adapt to prison to the point where it didn't bother me. Right. See, it really didn't bother me. Uh, I was transferred from Trenton to Rawway. Uh, which basically consists of the nation. We were, we were involved in the nation. Uh, 
various uh, activities and being in prison, there's really no basic structure in those days as far as rehabilitation. Okay. You know, you were locked up, you did various things within the prison, but as far as the idea of rehabilitation, that really wasn't the main focus. The main focus was punishment. And when I look back now, I could see that in a sense of speaking, I had become a state child. Raised by the institution. Raised by the institution. So this is my mentality that I had. And the result of that, even when I came home, I still had this mentality. Because it was never ingrained in my mind the idea about fully changing. In fact, in those days, back in those days, when you came home, you got a party. He was the hero of the block for a day. So the coming home from prison. Going to prison back then was a bad honor. Especially if you didn't tell nobody. Okay. See? And and so I'm saying my values were such that it was based on that type of mentality. Of you were serving time in, 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 in New Jersey in the system in the sex in the sixties. Akbar prayers from New Jersey. You had to come across him. Tell me your relationship. Akbar and I came up together. We grew up together. Okay. Akbar was always a step ahead of us in hustling. Okay. And so He always was about money? Always in high school, Akbar was about money. No doubt. He never drank, he never smoked, none of that. He's always he was always about money. And and, and being able to put himself in a position to get money. I, I remember when Akbar bought his first car. It was a Grand Prix. He bought a car with no license. This 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 is how he was. Advantage. And I think we were like maybe 18, 17, 18 years old. Mm -hmm. See? So Ark was always ahead of his time. Before the drug game became prevalent in, in, in the ghettos and, and hoods of, uh, of the United States, in the 60s, what did a, uh, a black man, for the most part, what would, what, what would he be incarcerated for? What, what y'all was getting into in the 60s? If I spoke about the 90s where I came up, we all sold crack. That's what we did. What did y'all do in the 60s? Go ahead. In Nook, it was bank robbery, hijacking, fencing, boosting, uh, various games in the streets, uh, three cop molly, other hustling games. I wanted to be a drug dealer, but I was my best customer. Okay. Let's see. What was your vice? Going to share it with him, bro. I did a lot of robbing. Okay. A lot of robbing. Uh, I couldn't boost. But at that particular time, I was using drugs. Mm -hmm. And so, I was involved in those situations in Newark and Harlem at that time. At that time, at that time, Harlem was an open drug market. Okay. Okay. And so... Who was in power in these, these times that you were visiting Harlem? Who was in power? Nicky Barnes. Okay. Ran Harlem. Uh, there's a brother who played basketball very well named P.B. Kirkland. No doubt. P.B. Uh, there were other, other brothers uh, such as... Uh, Frank Lucas, who had, they were called the Country Boys. No doubt. Okay. And uh, there's another brother named Hog Jaws. A lot, a lot of these brothers from North Carolina who moved to Newark. Right. So uh, no matter what you were doing, there was always a clique who was, who was doing that. Example would be I would come out in the morning and I was asked, what happened last night? 
did they get that truck. Right. So a lot of times I would get down with unloading hijack trucks. No matter what it was to do in the streets, it was always a money, uh, always a way to make money. Nook was a hustling town. You know, the whole thing was about getting money. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they had a saying back then where guys would say, man, I wouldn't work in a pie factory and take some pies. This, this is how the mentality was such as far as being in the streets. Okay. And, 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 and what happened, what happened to me was as time went along, it became a part of me. You would never have thought that I came from a good family doing what I was doing in the streets. See? And so you get blinded in the streets. You actually get blinded to a point whereby you make doing wrong part of your lifestyle. It's what I do. It's what I do to get paid. So there's a gap in the streets, or it was in the streets, between getting paid and not getting paid. You always want to be with guys who are getting paid. Things have changed now. Things have changed now. One thing that was important back in those days, believe it or not, in the streets was respect. There were certain things you did, there were certain things you didn't do. There was a line that you didn't cross. Example, if I had a woman, if we were partners, you couldn't date my woman. You could, that was a line you didn't cross. I didn't tell on you. My first time going to prison, I went to prison for not telling. Really. So, so, so the, the, the codes, the respect, the way you carried yourself, all play a part in who you were. And so for a lot of, for, for a lot of guys, sad to say, they never made out, out of that mentality. Right. You know, I was blessed in that I was able to finally reach a point in my life at 37 where I surrendered. But there's a price that I paid for this, having been in Trenton State Prison, Rawway State Prison, and Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary. How much time did you spend at Lewisburg? I was at Lewisburg approximately three years. Any notable inmates were there when you were there? Uh, John Gotti, Pee Wee Kirkman, uh, a lot of guys I met from different cities, uh, out of Philadelphia, uh, the Junior Black Mafia was there, out of Philadelphia, yes. Uh, at that time, there were, Lewisburg was actually meant for hardcore prisons, very simple. Okay. The Mafia, uh, various drug gangs from across the country, even from North Carolina. So in Lewis, actually Lewisburg was a hookup. Crime school. Yes, uh, it, it was a hookup. When you left Lewisburg, you had a library somewhere on a piece of paper where you had a connection no matter where you went. Right. See, uh, and in fact, Lewisburg was so corrupt as far as corruption went, the mafia had their own section. Their own section. Where they cook. So what we seen in the movies that was kinda accurate, they was in there cooking. It's on time. It's very on time. Jimmy Hoffa, every year for his birthday, the yard was cleared. And only he was in the yard. His wife would hire an airplane with a band that said Happy birthday, Jimmy. What year was this, bro? This is in 19... This is in 1978. I'm going to say 78. 
the 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 structure of Lewisburg was such that it actually was run in a manner example you came out in the morning and you never came back to your cell again to the evening. Oh, so y'all was y'all was wherever you were at doing count time, that's where you counted. Y'all was free with a fence around y'all. Wherever you wherever you were doing <coughs> count time, uh that's where you counted. And it was run in such a way as to they had torture cells. I call them torture cells. Some people call them lock up. I call them torture cells, really. Okay. Then they had four stages of lock up. Stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Stage one using the ground. With the windows painted, lights on twenty four seven. You couldn't get you couldn't flush the toilet unless they flushed it. You couldn't get water unless they gave it to you. You ate off a paper you ate off a paper plate with a wooden fork. Mm. Half rations. So any guy who came out of Lewisburg, if he wasn't if he wasn't mean when he got there, he was mean after leaving there. Because it, it actually turned you to a point where you actually began hating the whole system. And that's not rehabilitation. Right. See, that is not rehabilitation. <coughs> so, uh, I look back at my experience and what I went through, I think a lot, I still got my senses. Now I based thought, I based that on my faith in Allah and holding fast to my faith of Islam. Right. Well, um, where were you at in Islam in the 60s? We had prior conversations and the, the black man in America at the time was with Minister Farrakhan. He wasn't even Minister Farrakhan yet. Who was, in, who was running the Nation of Islam in the 60s? Wari D. Muhammad. It was overall uh, leader of the nation. But I was considered outlaw Muslim. In other words, we did various things in spite of being Muslim. We gonna talk about that. You know, we did various things in spite of being Muslim. I was never able to fully grasp Islam until the second resurrection. This is when there was a split. And that split took place when I was in Rawway. What was the split? Who who did what? What happened they sent Dr. Naeem Akbar to Rawway. Naeem Akbar? Yes, he came to Rawway. Okay. To explain to us that there are, that there was gonna be a, a change. That 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 that, 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 that the honorable uh Wari D. Muhammad was gonna introduce us to Al Islam based on the Holy Quran. Years ago in the nation they would say put the Quran on the highest shelf. Well we were putting the Quran on in the shelf physically. Not here. Right. So the the, 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 the the split came when Warif Dean Muhammad introduced us to our Islam based on the Quran. And so there was a vote. There was a vote. Those who were going to follow Farrakhan, Mr. Uh, Mr. Farrakhan, or those who were going to follow Warif Dean Muhammad. And there was some balance in that. There was some violence? Yes. Some brothers got hurt. I choose to go with uh, Warwick D. Muhammad. Because I was very, I've always been 
educated, edu educational minded. But I was very curious at this point about true Islam. Right. And I'm not going to 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 judge anyone. You know, we have what's called freedom of choice. So those there were those who continued uh, on the leadership of Mr. Farrakhan, and there were those of us who went with uh, Warrior Dean Muhammad. I'm, we're going to backtrack a little bit. You said that y'all, there was a split. You went with Wallace Dean Muhammad and, and others stayed on the path of the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. Explain the technical difference why you chose to go to with essentially the, the Sunnah. I have been greatly influenced by El Haj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X. So, my influence has always been affected by him and what he had bought. And when I read uh, uh, his book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, when I read when I get, read the part about him taking a hodge and being induced to uh, uh, Islam based on on, on the Holy Quran and what he, the message he brought back as far as race of people that he met of all different hues and colors who were Muslims. This is this. this also put a part in my thinking. So Malcolm came back from pilgrimage, from Hajj, and he basically said, the white man is not the devil. True. That's what he said, right? Yes. So that was basically the root of the issue that Malcolm had with the Nation of Islam? I don't think so. My own personal opinion. I was there. Uh, I was in Newark the day Malcolm got killed. Okay. But uh, there had been issues uh, prior to this. Some known, some unknown. Uh, the issue came up uh, concerning the the, the uh, um, Elijah Muhammad having children. Okay, that that and that that that's not something that's secret. That's no well known. Okay, uh, there was issues concerning uh, money. You know, you uh, there were some photos that were. Uh, circulated around that was shown around of uh brothers in Chicago wearing chinchilla coats and chinchilla hats and Cadillacs and Nook was the same way. Okay. Nook was the same way. Okay, you had brothers coming up to the mouth, Cadillacs and fur coats and so I'm saying Malcolm was confronting these issues. Okay. He was confronting these issues. And I believe that somewhere, my own personal opinion again, the government saw the opportunity to intervene and bring Malcolm down. Because what Malcolm wanted to do, one of the, one of the issues that Malcolm had, that Malcolm was pushing, was taking our plight to the United Nations. He wasn't talking about uh, uh, human rights. He was talking about the rights of a person, and we had the way we had been treated. We the only we the only nation of people, group of people, whose plight has never been taken to the United Nations. This is what Malcolm was playing, and he has the backings of the African Union and various other countries who knew our 40 years of slavery in this country, and we, we had been under our conditions, 
as far as that fight, and I believe this started a harness nest in the government. With those agencies in the government who play a part in taking down leaders who they consider to be dangerous. Okay. Kind of like the counterintelligence program. Certainly, certainly. Uh, 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 uh. This is my this is my issue with that. With what you just said, right? Malcolm X was killed by black men. The shooters were black. One of the shooters was from New Jersey. He's out. To, he's 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 free right now, right? Yes. I don't see the the correlation between the government and and, and a guy from New Jersey. The trigger man is only a trigger man. The one who truly pulls the trigger, you don't see him. Okay. See. You don't see him. And so when you study, really study, this government, whether it be CIA, FBI, or other intelligence agencies, and the way they operate, You really have to question how is it possible that Malcolm, being of his stature, small example, had no police protection that day he was killed. The police protection was pulled back. Was pulled back. Malcolm had me there recordings. I have a tape of the FBI coming to Malcolm and wanting Malcolm to be a snitch, to work for them. Okay. And Malcolm refused. So, looking at the history of Malcolm, and the issues he was presenting and bringing forth, example would be him and him and Martin Luther King were talking about collaborating. So the government is always aware of what they consider to be threats. These two men hooking up together, my goodness, there was no way on earth that the government, and I can continue to say the government because I know in my readings that the only way that these events could have taken place the nation of Islam didn't have the means to pull this off. Not to really pull off. Okay. Didn't have the means. The trigger man, yes, the physical trigger man came out of the nation. But it seemed like uh, the way that it was described there was a diversion and then the shooting, somebody with some type of strategic skill might have been behind that. I agree with you on that. There's always been one goal that this government has had. Don't let them unite. That's a fear. Right. See? And if you look at our condition today, it's work. It's work. It's work. It's work. And, 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 and so you look at the brothers who have been killed, like Martin Luther King, uh, the Black Panthers who were killed, uh, other civil rights leaders who were killed. Even Tupac, if you want to bring it down lately. And then and, and Biggie Smalls. See? They were talking about your name. And the government, the government has an ear as to what is going on 
in our community because there are so-called black men telling them. Right. 